All right, good evening. We'll go ahead and get started. I show six o'clock by uh, my watch. Um, I'm Chris Hines, Deputy Superintendent, and I'm facilitating our uh, rezoning process for our new elementary, Reuben Hope Junior Elementary School. And also with us on our webinar, this is our second in a series of three, uh, is uh, Executive Director of Operations, uh, Mr. Chris McCord, and uh, Mr. Rodrigo Chavez, who is our Director of Community Outreach and Dropout Prevention, as well as Health Services. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and um, kind of take you through uh, some information and, and get to the real, the meat of the presentation, which is showing some scenarios. So just to kind of catch everybody up, the Conroe Independent School District will be opening a new 950 student elementary school in August of 2021. It's going to be Reuben Hope Junior Elementary School and pre serving grades pre-K through four. And it's going to be located at 1470, 14755 Granger Pines Way in the Granger Pines development. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea where that is, it's not too far uh, actually down the road from uh, Milam and Grangerland, but it's over off 3083. There's just kind of the site layout of where the neighborhood's going in. They're already working on a, another track, so it's an old picture. Uh, this is a rendering of the uh, new school, what it would look like. There's an actual, what it looks like recently with uh, construction going on. Here's some of the visuals from the air. I see some pictures and you can see the neighborhood filling in nicely kind of as well as the school is coming in. So why is it necessary to do boundaries? Well, it happens from time to time and the most common reason is when we build a new school. And uh, sometimes we have to rezone when we see a, a school grow, we see shifts in density, we see uh, over time maybe a, a population ages and we see a school shrink in population. So we sometimes rezone to move students around to kind of take advantage of the existing capacity within our buildings. On September 30th, our enrollment was 64,512. We ended the year last year with 64,450. So we haven't grown a lot uh, with the COVID this year. You know, we're, we're like a lot of districts. We're a little bit lower in our uh, pre-K and kinder first grade enrollment. So certainly we're keeping an eye on that and, and how that might impact growth in the future. But the district does uh, continue to grow. So just to kind of give you a quick summary, if you were on our last webinar, we went through a lot of this information, but just to kind of prepare everybody, Austin Elementary is over capacity. It has currently 11 portable classrooms. And it's in a growing area. And so uh, my 2028, our demographic study uh, projects them at over 1500 students. In Creighton Elementary, which is a rather, it's a smaller campus, has a capacity of about 675 students. It currently has 10 portable classrooms. And in 2028, it's projected at over a thousand students. And then in addition, San Jacinto Elementary, which is also a, a rather small campus, is projected um, to grow by 2028 to almost 1300 students. And so certainly we know there's growth coming. Um, we don't know yet, you know, how um, the impact of the economy and things in the in the long run will, will speed up or slow down growth, but we do know that we're gonna continue to grow in these areas. So we have an elementary coming in. In addition, Patterson Elementary, which is in the Conroe feeder, um, finished last year right at capacity. And so there's, uh, they're pretty much a full campus. And so we're looking at uh, that campus in this process as well. So this is just a quick um, view of the map of the current attendance boundaries and the green area represents Patterson. And this little dark blue line that you see outlined represents the differences in the intermediates and the junior high feeders. So uh, Patterson feeds into uh, Bosman and Stockton Junior High on the Conroe High School. Um, there are a couple of areas that are on that go to Bosman that are zoned to Austin right now. And so you'll hear in some of our presentations some of these a little bit more about these areas. Um, this is our current zone. The yellow represents Creighton. The red is Austin, the blue Milan, and the light, uh, kind of a tannish color, is San Jacinto. We also know there's growth. We've had the question, like, where is the growth coming? We've tried to capture some of those areas. We don't, cap we don't have them all captured, but certainly there's, there's um, growth, and we've kind of highlighted these areas that we anticipate future growth and future development. There certainly can be more that comes in, and there, there are additional smaller developments that we do not have included on that map, but um, we do know that there's growth over the next few years planned. As we, as we plan, it's helpful to kind of let everybody understand the difference between geocoded and actual enrollment. Um, and, and we share that because sometimes we'll, we'll look at a school and say, well, there's this many students there, but when, you, when you're 
using planning numbers, it's not the same number. And that's because we use geocoded. Geocoded is the, the population that actually lives within that attendance of boundary. So that's real students that have real addresses in there. Schools often are 50, 60 students bigger. In the case of elementary, could be more than that at a larger school. Um, their enrollment's usually larger because of faculty uh, might bring their children to school. There might also be a special program there. So um, students from other uh, geocoded areas go to school there to receive a special program. So again, this is just a highlight of kind of where we are with the schools in the discussion. We do have Grangerland and Bosman uh, on the list. Uh, Grangerland, of course, is rapidly growing as well. Uh, that solution is coming in 2023 when we open a replacement for the current Moorhead Junior High School. So we do have a plan to re replace uh, Moorhead Junior High with a larger uh, junior high school. And when we do that, the current campus, which originally was Grangerland Intermediate, will revert back to an intermediate campus. And that'll be in 2023 when we pick up that additional campus, if all goes as planned. Uh, and you can see where we have portables. And again, through this process, we hope to solve for the portables um, at Austin and Creighton and Patterson is certainly at least as many as we can. Uh, we won't be able to solve for Grangerland until 2023. So what are we trying to do in this process? The objective of the is really to first and foremost create an attendance boundary that will fill up or define who goes to the new school. So uh, when we do that, that's our first goal. And then in doing so, we want to provide relief to the crowded schools, Austin and Creighton and San Jacinto. I want to give them a little bit of room. Uh, and if we can, we'll take a look certainly at uh, Patterson in this process. We will open an elementary school in the Conroe area uh, in 2022. And so we will next year be doing some rezoning in Conroe area as well. So I certainly wanted to, to mention that. We are projected to have uh, over 4,000 students in the Caney Creek Elementary feeder in 2025. And at that point, we will have a capacity of around 4,175. So we know that we're going to continue to fill up if, if the growth projections continue at the rate that, that the dem demographic studies have predicted. And what I can tell you from the past experience is sometimes growth happens faster, sometimes it happens a little bit slower, but generally the growth does happen uh, at some point. So we do know that um, we currently are at 3250. And so in getting ready for that year, we know we need to put uh, create greater capacity for elementary schools. And there is the reason why Hope will open. Um, in the in the eight year projection, uh, it's almost 5000 students. And so uh, certainly we know that we'll have to have another elementary school coming in uh, a few years after this one. And there is a another elementary in this uh, particular bond uh, package. Why is this process challenging? Well, it's challenging for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, schools are communities. And so anytime we change boundaries and change the makeup of a school, we're actually redefining that community. And we know that, and we don't take that charge lightly. We understand uh, the preciousness of each of our students, and we wanna be mindful of that. But it's also the reality of growth. And as we grow and as we open new campuses, we have to make changes and adjust attendance boundaries. So we know it's a difficult process. You know, families often have a history sometimes of going to a school. We know that people often buy their home to go to a specific school. Um, we also know that when we change the direction that people drive in the morning, that that can disrupt routines, everything from daycare to, you know, other errands that you might run or where you go to work. So um, changing boundaries can be disruptive to people's lives, and we understand that. And, we, and again, we don't take that lightly. Um, we are going to have to impact families to achieve our objectives, and we know that. So we want to look at it and do it as effectively and efficiently as we can. Uh, we do, as I mentioned, anticipate another elementary coming in the future, and then we do anticipate as well an intermediate school um, coming online in 2023. And these are all things we're just thinking about as we go through the process. We look at miles and mileage in terms of where people live and what happens when we change schools. And, you know, the hope is that um, it, we might be at some families closer to their school, but we also know the reality is some families might not. And so um, but we want to be mindful of it. And we try, our committee tries to look at distances as we make, um, make decisions and look at roadways and other things that might make sense. So we have several goals. Uh, all these are on our website. Um, but we certainly want to share those with you. We want to be mindful that first and foremost, we want to provide a quality education for our students. And so that's our goal 
regardless of where our students are zoned, our hope is that they will have an outstanding education wherever they go. And uh, we also, part of our goal is to have an attendance boundary committee that reflects um, viewpoints from the community. We do have parents, we do have administrators on our committee. Um, we wanna draw boundaries that, that support efficient use of our facilities uh, and resources. So as I mentioned, we don't wanna have a school sitting empty. We don't wanna have a school still overcrowded. So we're looking at that. Uh, we wanna be fiscally responsible. Uh, we do want to reduce crowding. We also want to be mindful of future growth. And as I mentioned early on, we know we'll have to turn around in a few years and do this again uh, when we open another school. And so we're trying to think about that and what the impact might be um, and, and how that might impact families again. Uh, when we open a new junior high, we know we will have an intermediate school. And so we're trying to think about the intermediate uh, schools as we do this as well. And then finally, we want to communicate, and certainly which brings us to our presentation this evening. So thank you for joining us. We have several considerations. Again, I've shared many of them. We look at capacity. We, we're taking input. And uh, towards the end, I'll get back on the website and share a little bit about where you can give input. Um, we look at history, geographical proximity, location of communities, natural boundaries, roads. We look at all those things. Uh, the number of times an area has been rezoned. The good news is we haven't done much rezoning in this area um, in several years. So um, we're not coming in and just after doing this a couple of years. And sometimes when we rezone in some of our fast growing communities, we might open a school every two years and have to turn around and do this again. And so the good news is we haven't done this in a while. Um, the bad news is, 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 is this side of our district continues to grow, we may have to do it more frequently in the future. Um, and then we also look at transportation patterns. So as I mentioned, we have a committee. This is our call our attendance boundary committee. We call it the ABC. And it's been a great committee and they've been working really hard. And we meet uh, roughly once a week and started back in September. So we've been uh, certainly working on this process and uh, I applaud all their effort. And I, at this point, we're gonna walk you through um, the, the committee's process, which is we've looked at several scenarios um, and we've, we've worked through it. We've kind of thrown out many of them for different reasons. And it's kind of, and I use it for lack of an analogy, it's kind of like going to the eye doctor and, and having to look at this lens and this lens and decide which one looks better. And so we go through a process of that, of trying to really look at scenarios and decide, is this something that we want, not want, and then weigh it and then decide if, we, if it gets excluded or not. So we've been through several. Uh, and several have been eliminated. Those are gonna be, if you wanna see most of them are on our website, not all of them, some of them are really bad. We didn't put them up there, but um, <clears throat> but we do have um, several up there to look at. And we also have the ones that are still in our consideration. So tonight we're gonna briefly take you through and show you the three scenarios that our committee is still considering, knowing that we will arrive at one of these uh, to take forward as a final recommendation in January. And so I'll, I'll come back later and kind of explain that process, but I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. McCord who will kind of explain the three scenarios that are still being considered by our attendance committee. Hey, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us. And uh, we're gonna take a virtual tour of the Caney Creek Zone. And we'll also look at numbers. And once we get to the end of each scenario, we'll talk about different considerations that pertain to that particular scenario. So. Without further ado, here we go on 6.4. So I would ask you to start and go south. And if you find uh, just things of, uh, to note, 33C, lower center, southern, is a uh, home of Lone Star Ranch. And that particular uh, section in 6.4 would move from San Jacinto to form the southwest corner of the Hope Attendance Zone. Additionally, on the southeast corner, you can find 31B, that moves from San Jacinto to Hope. Uh, moving up to the central portion, the nucleus of the zone, you'll find 25E and 25E, which is Forest Trace, and 27B, which is Tanglewood Farms. And it's also Frank Plunk Drive transition from Austin to Creighton. Uh, in the south, we'll go back down to 28B. And we'll find in the south, 28B goes from Creighton to Milam. And 31C, which is known as Whispering Pines, moves from Milam to Hope, forming the southeast corner of the Hope Zone. And then there's some significant changes to Milam. And going from Creighton to Milam, you'll find 24B, 26D, 27C, 
27E, 28B, 29, which includes Twin Lakes and Tower Woods, and 30 at the lower right, which is composed of Lost Lake and McAllister Road. So that is a quick tour of the geography of uh, the Candy Creek Zone. Here you can see, and you can, I think you can find this on the website, and obviously if you're watching this on uh, YouTube later on our YouTube channel, you can see the specific streets involved along with the zone and the impact numbers by the specific zone area. Uh, so 6.4, uh, it moves 747 students. That's on the lower end of all of our trend, potential transitions. And uh, that's a quick look at that. Let's talk about 6.4, and here's a prettier map. This shows you the end result of making those transitional changes. And so if you see, it gives you a pretty aesthetically pleasing, reasonable, good looking uh, map to look at for the Caney Creek zone for elementary so as we rezone for hope. Going to the enrollment totals, just some things I would draw your attention to on the enrollment totals. It does help Austin a little if you look at the numbers on enrollment. Creighton is 641, and Creighton will be static at that number in all the scenarios we present today based on the way we have to move things. So 641 for Creighton. Uh, Milam is at 488, and it is a number it can work with, and uh, so we're pretty good with that. The number, after you get past the geocodes, will come in higher. San Jacinto comes in lower at 350. We do know that as growth continues, which is planned in that area, that that number will go up. It'll go up because that's the geocoded number, but it will also grow up quickly in the next few years because that's where growth is planned to be. Patterson, it doesn't give Patterson any enrollment relief as far as attendance. You see it's at 800. Hope opens with a lower number of 399, and uh, it will be over 400 when push comes to shove, but it does put it at 399, and this scenario doesn't really impact Anderson at all. Uh, in the Conroe zone, and uh, so it leaves Anderson at 438, and it could use a few more students. And so let's move on to considerations, and I'm trying not to reiterate what I've already said, but so 6.4, uh, 33C to hope would allow the school to uh, open with a larger amount of students and get it close to 400. It'd probably be over, well over 400 uh, once it actually push came to shove. Obviously, San Jacinto is smaller, Creighton will have a limited amount of space for growth at 641. Austin gets a little help, but it does remain larger at 725. Uh, it does move uh, around 748 students. It, it, one thing to note for 6.4 is that it does not solve for the fact that students from Austin are split into two different intermediate feeders. So those are the considerations in a quick geographical overview of 6.4. So we're going to move on and we're going to transition to scenario seven and I'll go through the same path. So let's talk about geography. So the one thing that you'll notice, I, I draw your attention to the top left or the northwest, is that this uh, scenario does help uh, address a number of issues for a larger number of schools and that it does move some students from Patterson over to Anderson. So they go from Patterson over to Anderson in the Conroe zone. Uh, look at 28B and 31C, 28B and 31C in the lower right. Those uh, are the same as with 6.4. It is noteworthy if you look on the lime green, 26C and 27A move from Austin to Patterson, which transitions them from the Caney Creek zone to the Conroe feeder. 26C and 27A. Patterson does receive some relief. If you look northwest, you see D14, which is composed of Sterling Place and Oak Tree Drive going to Anderson potentially, and 13 at the very top, which is composed of Creekside Acres, Northridge, Settlers Crossing, Caney Heights, and Hillcrest Acres. Also move from Patterson to Anderson. Uh, the same transition holds as we saw in 6.4 for 25E and 27B located centrally in the nucleus of the Candy Creek zone. I would draw your attention to the lower left to 34A. And an important note here for this version, senior scenario seven, is that in 34A, 
this geographical area, which is fairly large, would transition from Milam to the New Hope Elementary. Uh, and that would significantly increase the geographical footage or footprint, if you would say, of Hope Elementary. So that is uh, something to note. So seven is similar to 6.4, but note in this scenario, 33C located in the Southern Central location of the Candy Creek Zone, that stays with San Jacinto in this scenario. And so that's a quick overview of the geographical changes. And now we're gonna switch slides. You can look at this later or look at it at your own leisure. This goes in one thing that I think is helpful here, it shows you the specific impact, not just of the geography, but the total number of students that would approximately be impacted within each zone. So this uh, uh, scenario really helps a larger number of schools. The, if you look at the lower right, the number of 982, uh, to accomplish that, it does impact uh, a larger number of students than 6.4 does and brings us in at 982. And that brings us to the next. You can see some, some totals here for, your, for a specific school. It does give some good relief to Austin. It brings it down to 626. Creighton has remained static at 641, as we alluded to. Milam is smaller. It still comes in north of 400. San Jacinto is a little smaller, but it still comes in north of 400. Patterson gets a little bit of relief. It brings it down to 777. Hope opens south of 400. But uh, we believe after you get past the geocoding, it would be north of 400 as more students show up. And it does give some help and some needed numbers to Anderson and brings it to approximately 572 students. So if we go to the next slide and we look at considerations, so not to reiterate it, but to hit the highlights. So scenario seven, students move from Patterson to Anderson, some relief. Austin receives substantial relief. San Jacinto would have a smaller number of students with growth expected. Uh, Creighton stays at 641. Hope it opens with a little bit larger population. It gives better numbers to some campuses, specifically Patterson and Anderson. And it does move a large number of total students, 982 total. So that is a quick overview of scenario seven. So we'll quickly, in the interest of time, transition to uh, 7.1. As you look at 7.1, the highlights, I would look down and the big differences in 7.1 in 7 versus 7.0, if you see 33C, 33C moves from San Jacinto from the south and goes north to Hope. And then obviously here, uh, 34A, once again, said it a lot, a large geogra geographical footprint in this particular scenario, 34A goes back and remains part of the Milam uh, footprint for students. And uh, if you pa pass forward, fast forward, here we go. Here's the impact. It's about the same as 7.0. It's at 993. So we're still south of 1,000. It gives you the specific numbers by zone and the streets and or areas that would be impacted and breaks it down in a different way of looking at it as uh, far as what school I'm going from to. And I hope that will be helpful to you as you uh, analyze. It's a, little bit, it's a little bit more of the impact, not much, but it's a little more impact than seven, but it's a little higher. So, and then we go here, here's a look at what it does for the individual schools. If you look at what it does for the individual schools, gives Austin some help, Cranes at 641, Milam opens at a pretty good number. Uh, San Jacinto opens small, but the emphasis of that is that's for now. We know a lot of growth is coming. Patterson got a little bit of help, and Hope opens at a number that it can work with and pending some more growth, and it got Anderson help. So uh, 7.1, just like 7, addresses a lot of schools and helps with a lot of situations. Remembering the whole while, this these are real kids, and we're trying to put the school's in a good place and the student's in a good place to be their best. So that is an overview of 7.1. The considerations, once again, larger footprint for Milam. San Jacinto would have a smaller number of students. Cranes at 641. Austin gets relief. Milam increases. Hope opens with a needed larger population. Helps out Patterson and Anderson. 
and moves just south of 1,000 students around 993. If you look here, here's another way of looking at it. It helps to have different angles. And uh, you can look at different scenarios and look at the three bottom ones. And we've looked at a lot of scenarios, our committee. And if you look here, you know, one thing, Creighton runs about 641 every time. You can see the seven series. The seven series is gonna help out Austin. It's gonna bring it south of 700. Now, if you look at Milam, we're working to keep everything if we can, and if possible, north of 400. That will have, you see what you see is 6.4 and 7.1 and seven for Milam. San Jacinto is impacted, uh, it shrinks in a couple of the scenarios. Remember growth is coming and that growth is gonna be coming pretty fast. So as it gets smaller, we would not expect it to stay small for long. Patterson, the seven series, that gives assistance to Patterson. It gives them a little bit of relief and a little bit of help. Hope. Uh, Hope opens in all three scenarios. Hope opens around 400 students in its first year. And you can see the real benefit of the seven series. Either one of the seven series gives some good help to Anderson and brings them up north of 500. So that is a quick overview. And of course, you'll have it whenever you want to look at it here on the presentation on YouTube. Thank you very much, Mr. McCord. And just to kind of remind everyone where we're at. This is actually, we're, we're now kind of finishing the second leg of a, of a three-part uh, series. So the first part was we were talking about where we're doing this process and, and really collecting some information. And now we've been working on it. We're back to say, here's where we're at. The next time that we'll present will be uh, in December where um, our plan is, we keep our fingers crossed, our plan is at that point to uh, reveal what the recommendation is from the committee that will go to our school board. So that's really our goal for that December meeting is to kind of say, here's what's coming out. And then uh, once our board has an opportunity to meet and make a decision, finalize the decision, we'll come back and communicate with all the impacted families. And, and, and this it is a reality, this is a uh, scenario where to, to fill up a, a zone in the middle, we're having to pull from both ends of the of this attendance boundary from this feeder zone. And so it does impact a substantial number of families and we understand that. We do not take this lightly. Uh, we are committed, as we said earlier, to providing quality schools. And you know, our timeline is a January recommendation to the board. There's um, several resources online. I'm gonna see if I can drag over the web page here and just briefly show this. Um, and what we do know is that um, if you if you go to our main page, let me go back to the main Conroe page. Um, if you look, there's a little icon for the ABC page and it takes you to the event attendance boundary uh, process and outlines a lot of things and goals and what we consider. Uh, we have it in Spanish. Um, and then if you go here to the HOPE process, right now we only have one, uh, sometimes we have multiple attendance boundary process is going on at once. Right now we only have one, and that's the HOPE uh, attendance boundary for the new school. And uh, there's a committee link and there's a website to HOPE. There's not much on there at this point um, for a few pictures. And then there's an opportunity to give feedback. You can, can, you can uh, submit feedback here on a form. Uh, and that comes in, we, uh, we summarize those and get those to our committee members. These are, if you're interested, we have PDFs and maps of all the scenarios, most of all the scenarios we've looked at, as well as the three that are still under consideration. Um, we will, I will put a PDF of this PowerPoint on our uh, webpage as well, and this uh, archive video will also be available. And there's some other information, our current maps, the demographic study is available if you're interested, like where do we get those numbers from about growth? And, um, there's a lot of information there. There's also a Q&A. Uh, section and we've been trying to add those as we get questions that have come in. I'll try to um, take us back through a few um, that we've already had. So let's see if I can keep it moving. But there's a lot of resources there online and I just showed you all of these, but these are some screenshots I had just in case I didn't get on the web. Um, so I'll hit some of the questions we received and try to uh, maybe answer those. Which grade levels will be impacted? It's going to be a, a kinder through four, 
So those are the impacted groups. We assume there'll be a pre-K program at this at the new school. Um, we're, are we doing intermediate boundaries? No, we are not doing intermediate or junior high or high school boundaries during this process. We're strictly looking at elementary. Um, we are being mindful of, as I mentioned earlier, that we will open an intermediate school in 2023. Uh, we've had the question about special programs. Uh, running the preliminary numbers, we anticipate that we will have a bilingual program at our new school. Um, but certainly we won't know the final answer to special programming until we finish the process um, and, and start doing our enrollment projections. But uh, we do anticipate pre-K. We, uh, with special education programming, we, we don't always offer everything in every school. We sometimes cluster programs, meaning that um, there might not be enough students to make a program in one school. So we might take students and bring them to another campus. So we usually cluster. Um, and so that's something that it will depend on the program. Some services will be available to every school, but there will be some where we may not have enough students, so we cluster. Uh, what about students that finish third grade? Well, if students are in third grade at their current school and they get moved, they are able to finish fourth grade. They can put in for a transfer and stay at their current school to finish out elementary at their current school. However, we do not provide transportation, so that would be a that would be incumbent on the family to be able to transport their child. Um, we do allow transfers to finish out um, for that fourth grade year. We also get the question, suppose they have a little brother or sister, can they stay with them during that year? And the answer is yes, we don't divide the family up. So if a family has a child going into fourth grade next year and they wanna finish and they can provide transportation, they can put in for a transfer. Who, de who, de who decides or ultimately determines which scenario will be selected? Well, our committee, our attendance boundary committee is the group that studies it and looks at the different options and makes a recommendation. And the school board is the group that will officially determine what is selected. So it's a board decision, but it's a committee recommendation just to understand the relationship. Um, are there any, are these scenarios, these three scenarios, any of them subject to change? And the answer to that is scenarios are always subject to change because drawing boundaries are fluid and we, we always are moving. But um, the short answer is we don't want to make any major changes from what we're showing you tonight. If we did some minor tweak, something that was available in one scenario or another scenario or is currently in place, we might consider altering. Uh, if it's going to be a major change, something that we haven't seen, we'd want to come back and kind of reintroduce it and give some opportunity for feedback. So um, we don't want to make any major changes, but we could make a minor tweak. Um, but to answer that question, yes, they, they could be. Um, another question we have, we live about a half a mile from our school, will I be rezoned? And the answer is, you know, generally we're mindful of that. That's one of our considerations where you are in relation to the buildings. Uh, we try to look at that. Um, but certainly, uh, if you looked at those boundaries, there were a couple of areas that are closer to Austin than Creighton, and they're being moved to Creighton. And that really had to do with, if you looked at the attendance boundary area north of Austin that needs to come down, they're closer to Austin. So we didn't want, you know, so sometimes you do get moved to a school that's a little further than the one that you're at to, and it does it does happen uh, we try to avoid it when especially if you're real close but it does come up um, i live very close to mile and hope and that will be a reality right they're very uh, close to one another just a couple of miles difference and i want to attend the new school can we choose to be enrolled there so the district does have a process for applying for transfers it's on space available and there's some other factors that may come up um, but that's a separate process. The first process that will open will be in the early spring, will be for students that want to finish the fourth grade and their siblings. And then there's another process that goes in later in the spring, April uh, and May, where families, if they want to attend another school because it's more convenient or because I work there and I want my child to come with me, that's a separate process and that will go on as well. Um, I don't live anywhere near the new school. How likely will I be rezoned? And we've shared, if you, you know, through these scenarios, that there are a lot of people that get impacted on this scenario, on all these scenarios, in order to take advantage of where we're crowded and to move students to where there's space. So, um, you know, it's not, it's, unfortunately, this is not an opportunity where we just have all the growth we need right there around the new, new school. We don't. And so to, to fill that up, we have to bring students from elsewhere and to solve for crowded schools, we have to move students. So um, that is one of the challenges. Um, next question is, will my bus time be improved? In my, you know, in looking at it, our analysis 
for some families, yes, and for some families, no. Um, but certainly it's something that we've looked at. And then how likely is it that I'll be rezoned in the near future? And we're always mindful of that. So we're trying to be careful about who we move this time and not move them again next time. But there will be a next time. We will have to rezone. And ultimately, in a perfect world, we try not to do the same child um, between kindergarten and fourth grade more than once. Um, we do have another school coming in the Caney Creek feeder. And so we may not be able to do that. We're going to try. But um, but if we can, in a perfect world, we'd like to not rezone until they can um, end up, if they started kinder at one school, let them go first, second, third, fourth, before we change them again. But we will have a new school coming in the future. And I do anticipate, because this is not a densely populated area, that we're going to have to do reshuffling again. So I want to be upfront about that. But we won't know until we get through uh, to that process. But I think it's 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 possible that we will have to do some rezoning of families that get rezoned this time again in a few years and that could be three years it could be four years it could be five years but it's going to be in the next few years um what, uh, how likely i'm sorry my child receives speech therapy if i'm rezoned will they still receive services and the answer is yes we're going to provide those services and, and something like speech generally is going to be provided at all of our schools um, but as I mentioned earlier, some, some services are not always available at every school we cluster, but they're always available to the students who qualify and need those services. So if that's the case, we'll just transport the child to where the services are. Um, so that, that kind of wraps up our um, presentation. Our next meeting is going to be on Thursday, December the 6th at 10 o'clock, where we hope to be able to share what our committee recommendation will be. Uh, we are still looking at feedback, so I encourage um, people to submit any uh, comments or feedback that they have, and we'll share that with our committee, and we'll be sure to look at it. Um, I want to take a moment and just double check to see uh, Mr. Chavez or Mr. McCord have anything to add before we sign off. No, I just say thanks for joining us, uh, whether you join us live or on YouTube, and that next meeting is Thursday, December 10th at 6 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you then. Mr. Chavez, anything like that? I know we will be putting a Spanish version of this presentation up as well, and that may take a couple of days before it gets posted, but we will also have that. And again, I want to say thank you to everyone uh, for joining us, and have a great evening.